own skeleton at paragraphs 25 and 57 make it um, fair and plainly clear that it is very much a secondary contention. Uh, and the essence of Moore's submission is that the judge was entirely right to dismiss it for the reasons which he gave at paragraphs 110 and following the judgment. Could not you, the least could you, of which could, could you you possibly on. speak a little louder? Yes, I'll, try, I'll try to do something. Not, not the least of those reasons being that the narrow case simply does not fit with the actual wording of the force majeure clause. The essence of the narrow case is that the only thing which the reasonable endeavours have to be directed towards for the purpose of 36.3d is contractual performance of cargo operations, which are referred to in 36.3b. Provided a workaround can be achieved which allows the cargo operations to be performed in accordance with the contract. The fact that the, the workaround involves departing from the contract in some other respect is really of no significance at all, according to the narrow case, so long as there is an overall reasonableness um, in a general sense. And the problem with that is that it simply does not fit um, with the wording for reasons to do with the meaning of the word it in each of the subclauses, which my Lord, Lord Justice Arnold put to my learned friend this morning. Um, with respect to my learned friend, it, the, the argument really does involve saying that it in D bears a different meaning, certainly to the meaning of it in B, uh, and also, uh, I suggest, the meaning of it in A and C, uh, and that just won't work. The broad case um, is that <coughs> departing from the contractual performance in any respect doesn't really matter. That the only criterion for a workaround within 36.3d is that it be reasonable, using that sense in the that uh, phrase in the largest sense, that the fact that it involves a departure from performance according to contractual terms may have a bearing on the facts of any particular case uh, as to whether or not the proposed workaround is reasonable. But beyond that, there is no significance in the fact that a, a proposed solution and proposed reasonable endeavours would involve a variation or uh, the acceptance of non-contractual performance. Now that proposition, that broad case, does raise a point of general principle as to how a court or a tribunal should approach questions of variation or non-contractual performance in the context of a reasonable endeavours proviso, which on its face is completely silent about whether it does or does not extend to those matters. <clears throat> and that scenario of the silent reasonable endeavours proviso covers two different situations. The first is an express reasonable endeavours proviso, which does not explicitly state on its face either way whether or not it extends to variation or non-contractual performance. And that is what your lordships have here in clause 36.3d. The second and different scenario is that of the implied reasonable endeavours clause. Now, as we have set out in our skeleton at Paris 16 to 18, uh, reasonable endeavours provisos are readily implied into force majeure clauses which do not contain them expressly just as the court readily implies into an exceptions clause, which does not say so expressly, that the exceptions clause will not apply if the defendant has been negligent. Um, but when uh, a reasonable endeavours provision uh, or a negligent provision is implied, um, all that 
any case where the RE uh, reasonable endeavours proviso is expressed or silent, or in any case where the reasonable endeavours proviso is implicit. And in fact, the upshot would be that if um, RTI's broad case were to succeed, variation or non-contractual performance would potentially be required under any force majeure clause or exceptions clause where there's a, a, a negligent proviso, any clause which does not expressly provide to the contrary. The parties would have to contract out of that conclusion by providing otherwise in their contract. <coughs> um, and the essence of our case, really, my lords, is that that puts things the wrong way around. We accept that there is no reason as a matter of law why contracting parties cannot extend a reasonable endeavours proviso or an exception proviso to matters of variation or non-contractual performance if that is what they want to do. There may be sound commercial reasons why it would not be an intelligent thing to do, to do with considerations of certainty which I'll come on to, but as a matter of law, freedom of contract means that if that is what the parties want to do, then they can do it. But the essence of our submission on the broad case is that a court or tribunal should not conclude that that is what the parties have done unless the contract demonstrates that intention by clear words. It should not, therefore, be a matter of contracting out or extending an FM, a, a reasonable endeavours proviso to variation or non-contractual performance. It should be a matter of contracting in. Um, and in my submission, that proposition is supported both by considerations of principle and by authority, in particular, Bullman and Fennick and Van Kinderstrike, which I will come on to. Now, if the court accepts that proposition, that uh, uh, a reasonable endeavours proviso should not be taken to extend to variation or non-contractual performance in the absence of clear words, then that ought to be the end of the broad case. Because there's really nothing in the particular words of clause 36.3d to indicate a positive intention to extend the application of the proviso to matters of variation or non contract support. And I don't understand RTI to suggest really that there is in the context of the broad case. And in the context of the narrow case, there's the submission that 36.3 does extend to particular aspects of performance, that is to the cargo operations, um, but that currency is not a, a concern under 36.3D. But again, that's not part of the broad case, that's the narrow case. Now, um, my lord, before we get into the detail, I wanted to say something about what is the nature of the case that we have here, the legal nature, which may sound like a bit of a detour, but, but I think we'll actually get, as I go through it, to, to some of the, the detail of the case along the way. Well, Mr. Reason, before you get into that, can you just help us a little bit on the factual substrate? <coughs> because, as you, you will have gathered from some of the questions coming from court, one thing that certainly I find puzzling, and I'm not, I don't think I'm alone in this, is, is how this all arises. Because it's your client, Nur, which invoked the FM clause, that we understand, obviously. Um, but if one asks who was the party affected by the situation on the, on the ground at the time, um, the problem was that the US banking system would have held up US dollar payments while investigating the impact <coughs> of the sanctions. Um, and one might have thought that the party immediately affected by that was RTI, because it was RTI that was the paying party making the US dollar payments. But of course, it wasn't RTI that invoked the FM clause. So, how does this work? My Lord, um, there's no reason in principle why uh, an FM event within the scope of Clause 36.3 might not affect both parties. No reason at all in principle why it may not. Um, no reason of construction of the, the language used in the clause. No reason in law. Um, there's been a, a case recently um, of, of uh, Your Honour Judge Pelling. In, I think, the Commercial Court of Central London County Court, where 
that situation arose. Both parties were affected. And the party affected had to give a notice. And I think the argument was along the lines of, well, both parties were affected, and therefore that disqualified either, either party giving a notice. And, and Alexander Judge Pelling said, no, what, what it means when it says party affected giving a notice is it means the party which is seeking to invoke um, force majeure. But that was a case in which both parties were affected by the relevant event. And that may be the analysis here. It may be that if you go through it in terms of chronology, the first party affected was RTI, because RTI found itself unable to um, perform its contractual payment obligation. Now, my, my, may I just intervene there, forgive me, to say something about um, some points that Lord Justice Newey raised, the effect that, well, they, they could perform their contractual obligation. Well, with, with, respect, with respect, my Lord, it's perfectly obvious that they couldn't. And the proof of that is that they didn't. If they could have performed the contract, they would have done, and their incentive for doing so would have been that that would have cut the rug from under our claim for force majeure. I, I think that the real sense of your Lordship's point was that when one dug down into the nitty gritty of the US law analysis before the tribunal, it turned out that making payments of US dollars wouldn't have been unlawful. And that is right. <coughs> there was a point at which we at Moore believed payment in US dollars would involve contravention of sanctions by pretty much everybody involved, banks, recipients, payers. The tribunal found, as a matter of American law, and therefore as a matter of fact, that that was incorrect. There was no impediment as a matter of US law to payment in dollars being made. But they also found, as a question of fact, that whatever the strict legal provision, US banks through whom the money would have to be routed would be extremely cautious they would make inquiries and, and there would be delay. Now I think that then, uh, uh, my, my Lord Lord Newey's point said, well what that really means is that they could perform their contractual obligation to pay in dollars, but there'd just be a delay. But, but with respect, my Lord, paying dollars, paying the right currency late, is no more contractual performance than paying the wrong currency on time. And again, if they could have complied with their contractual obligation, they would have explained that the reason they tendered a different currency was that they couldn't pay the right currency in accordance with the contract. The obligation was to pay the right amount in the right currency at the right time. And plainly just, they could not do that. Just help me on this, um, because it, I think it's apparent I haven't got to the bottom of the facts. Um, you invoke force majeure. Uh, you say um, we can't have payment broadly. No, actually, if I take the judge's summary, this is paragraph 26 onwards. Uh, it would be a breach of sanctions if Mer were to load further cargoes. Sanctions will prevent dollar payments. So you say you can't have dollar payments. And that led. And that, that would all prove to be right, at least to the extent that the dollar payments were going to be held up in the bank. May not have prevented them in the sense of making payment unlawful, but there was prevention in the sense that they couldn't be paid on time. So you weren't saying, look, you better pay earlier because it, payments might be no. delayed. You were saying you can't have dollar payments. We, we, we didn't say that. They didn't propose it. This was, Lord Justice Bales came up with a clever suggestion that they could have sent the payments earlier. That, that wasn't, I'm afraid, thought of, wasn't gone into in the hearing, but no findings about any of that. And just just help me a bit further. So paragraph 27, looking at the judge's judgment, RTI responds, sanctions wouldn't interfere with cargo operations, payment could be made in the US, <coughs> Mer weren't a US person caught by the sanctions. Um, but you then say, freight is specified in US dollars, I mean, well, one sees at 27 that as, almost as soon as we raised the sanctions point, they were talking about paying in euros instead of dollars. And uh, the comment in 28 that freight is specified in US dollars in the recap, that was our response to that. That was our point coming in then. The, the contractual. So at a very early stage, they're talking about paying in euros. And that's obviously because they recognize they can't pay in dollars. 
Well, they say they were wrong about that. But um, uh, the... Well, if uh, they thought they couldn't pay as a matter of law, they may have been wrong. They couldn't pay as a matter of fact. I mean, if you're saying, look, we can't accept uh, dollars, you can't pay us in dollars, they then look around for a, a, a solution. Yes. Um, but if you, as a blanket position, have said, well, we can't take dollars, is it apparent that um, there was any non-contractual uh, problem because uh, you were wrong about that? We were, we did prove you wrong about that. Um, th but there's no finding that they attempted to make a payment in dollars and we rejected it. Um, and you'd on the contrary, there is, a fi there is a finding by the tribunal that they, they would have had difficulty making payments in dollars because of the delay that had been, that had been caused. It's all a bit odd, isn't it? Because you're not entitled to payment in advance of loading. No. Only five days after the bill of lading. Five, five so days after. All cargoes on board. So, and, and in fact, as a matter of law, they could have paid, even though it seems that maybe both sides at the time thought that they couldn't. Um, and all that would have happened if they tried was that the money would have come through a bit late. Late. Which wouldn't have been a timious payment, but that wouldn't have been performance of the contract obligation. I, mean. now, I, I appreciate, I do appreciate. But one of the slight challenges of this case is that these nuances about the facts are not necessarily articulated in the tribunal's findings in quite the level of detail which one might have expected if this was the only point that the tribunal had to decide in the arbitration. But, but your lordship's injustice to the tribunal must bear in mind that it was not. This point, clause 36.3d point, which we are listed for a day and a half to debate before the Lordship, was but one aspect of a wider force majeure issue in the arbitration involving substantial uh, expert evidence about the position of the American law. And the force majeure dispute was but one dispute within the arbitration. Uh, your, your Lordship has not been troubled with the first chunk of the award, which is about four ships from late 2017 to late tw to early 2018 before the force majeure event was ever declared. Your Lordships have not been troubled with the last 50% of the award, which is about the balance of the Murray's dispatch on something like 100 voyages. So you've got those disputes at either end. The force majeure is sandwiched in between. And this is but one aspect of the force majeure award. But one has to read the, the tribunal's award fairly and reasonably. And, and one has the clear finding at paragraph 51 that we succeeded on all aspects of the force majeure defence. And with does the exception of 36.3e. Yeah, I follow that. Is it implicit in that that RTI could not perform? Or is it is that merely proceeding on the basis that whether or not they could perform there was a force majeure event? It is implicit in that that the tribunal found on the facts that clauses 36.3a and b and C were satisfied. That is to say, there was a relevant event, which may have been government orders or may have been restrictions on payment transfers, it doesn't really matter, um, and that it had the requisite causal impact upon the performance of the Charter Party to satisfy all the requirements with the exception of 36.3D. That and is that necessarily implicit. But that doesn't of itself say whether or not one should take it as implicit that there was a finding that RTI could not perform. Well, one reads it in the context where the tribunal have along the way made findings again of facts that whatever the strict legal position, and they decided the strict legal position was they didn't entitle to a payment, but whatever the strict legal position was, banks would have been very cautious and everything, payments would have to be routed through um, US banks um, and, and that would have caused a problem. That is um, really paragraphs 45 and 46 of the award in the core bundle at um, tab 7, page 100. 
Um, so 45 and... 45 to 46. That's the factual finding about the response of the US banks in terms of the practical delay of my Lord's So the tribunal have found that. Um, so so the, what they have found is that had RTI made a dollar payment, the banks would have uh, looked at it carefully before honouring it. Um, does it follow from that that RTI couldn't perform its contractual obligations? Well, one has to look at the totality of it in my submission. You have that part of the factual background that the tribunal are reasoning their way towards a conclusion on the decision. They have that, there's that finding of fact. There's then a finding that clause 36.3 A, B, and C are satisfied, and the only link in the chain is 36.3 B, which, which involves a finding by the tribunal that there has been um, something which constitutes a uh, restriction of money transfers or government order, that's the sanction, which has had a causal effect sufficient to satisfy the, um, uh, uh, the causal effect of the force majority. Uh, now, again, the inference surely is that it's been an impediment to payment. Now, again, I accept that your Lordship, I understand your Lordship might like to have seen it set out point by point. Uh, it isn't, but there are reasons, understandable reasons why it's not. I mean, on the face of it, they, it proceeds on the basis that um, the circumstances were such that uh, you couldn't be expected to proceed with loading um, because of the potential problem. But that's not obviously the same as a conclusion that RTI could not perform its contractual obligation. The fair inference, my lord, and this is what the judge concluded, the fair inference is that the tribunal um, accepted the point which we have made in our original force majeure notice uh, at paragraph 26 um, of the award, which was that we could not sensibly be expected to perform a contract if we weren't going to get paid. Could you just give us the reference in the judgment? Uh, yes, my lord, um, it's in the award itself, which I'm dealing with, it's got rather bigger print. Um, that's tab seven, page 123, and in the judgment, which is tab five, it is uh, starts at 20, 26, paragraph 26 of judgment, page 64 of tab five of the call bond. But they didn't accept that, did they? Is, is, it, is, it, is it around about 164 of the judgment? Um, because if he's, this is where he's just dealing with one of the, the, the respondents' notice points. Um, and I, I'm thinking about what he says towards the end of that paragraph. Is when the range of permissible decisions for a tribunal is concluded, parties would not contemplate that such operations would continue if owners were not being paid the freight to which they were entitled, by which I assume he means on time. Now, maybe the judge's interpretation, but going back, you say, well, the tribunal accepted your notice, but you said in your notice, having reviewed the effect of these sanctions in General Licence 12, we note that, subject to the terms of licence, it would be a breach of sanctions for owners to continue with the performance of the TOA, and they don't accept that. They don't accept that, but we then did say, we note, it, we note also, that it would prevent payment of dollars. And they don't accept that either. Well, they don't accept that it prevented it as a matter of law. But they do accept that it delayed it at the very least as a matter of practice. Well, can we just look at that? Where do they find there would be delay? What they, what they, if it's paragraph 46, what they say is they would exercise extreme caution before making a payment. Yes, well, that's right. not necessarily the same as a finding that there would be delay. They would need to think about it, but they would ultimately do it. Ultimately. Ultimately. Well, that may be the point, Ronald. Well, they've got five days. Ultimately, um, it may not be good enough. They, they've got to pay on time. And again, one comes back to I mean, from, from, from the owner's point of view, there is uncertainty as to whether they will get paid on, on time, but there is no finding, sir, that payment 
could not or would not be made on time. But there, there is no explicit finding as to when payments would be made. So again, I come back to the point I concede. Uh, and I understand that, that your lordships are wondering what is the precise reasoning here? And why is it not spelt out point by point as they go through it? And the reason why it isn't are the reasons I've given your lordships. I mean, one has to understand that the tribunal was not dealing with this in quite the same way that your lordships are as the sole point for the one and a half days. But what one sees that they are starting off from a force majeure notice served by us, which makes what we submit as a common sense point that we cannot be expected to continue to perform the cargo operations if we're not going to be paid. There's then a decision that we were wrong to say that we weren't going to be paid to the extent that we meant by that that we couldn't be paid as a matter of law. Because as a matter of US law, we could be paid. But notwithstanding that, crucially, you see that the word by law that paragraph 45 of the award, crucially the expert will be. And this is something which is important to the tribunal's reasoning. This is not simply something which they are noting in passing as they go through the facts. So they make that crucial finding. There's then the finding that in practice virtually all US dollar transactions are rooted through US banks. Now, what's the significance of that? The significance of that is that the position to be taken by US banks, as stated in 45, gives rise to a problem, and it can't be got around by routing payment through some other bank, because in practice, you have to route US dollar payments through some banks. Again, this is not simply being decided as a matter of interest. This, this is part of the reasoning, and the tribunal is here identifying something which is causing a problem with the transmission of the funds. But you it can't get around it by rerouting it to another bank. Well, it seems to proceed on the basis, look, uh, you could anticipate that there could be problems with the banks uh, transferring the payment. Therefore, it was fair enough for you to say, we're not going to load. Um, therefore, you uh, could claim there was a force majeure event. But that's not the same as any finding that uh, RTI contractually could not honour its obligations. Well, <clears throat> one comes back, Lord, to, to sorry if I repeat myself, one comes back to the point that they didn't. They didn't honour that obligation. But so arguably, that was because, I mean, we don't know, it wasn't investigated, as far as I know, but arguably that was because you shut down the possibility. Well, You'd said, we're not going to take dollar payment. Well, you, you can see that there's no findings of that effect in, in the award. There's, there's no, no finding either. There's no suggestion yes, in the award that that was part of what your lordship sees is that the tribunal found that there were going to be, if not legal impediments, practical impediments in the sense of delays, at least, to payment in US dollars. What one knows is that there were not payments in US dollars. Now, again, I come to the point. If RTI could have performed their obligations in accordance with the then they would have done so. And it is obvious that they would have done so because that would just have cut the rug from under the force majeure argument. And again, there is no finding or no suggestion of any argument that we, that we could have done it, but we didn't because we thought that you were rejecting it. Is, is that right? They're not obliged to pay until you've loaded. But if you're not loading, then they don't have anything to pay for. So, well, so the, your, your argument, well, the proof of the pudding is that they didn't pay. Um, comes up against the problem that they didn't have to pay because you didn't load. Well, with, with, with respect, my lord, if paying would have removed the um, force majeure argument and we'd have had to say, OK, we've got to start loading again, then they'd have paid. And that's just, never mind what the strict legal analysis may be, that's just a matter of commercial common sense. If we were saying, because you can't pay, we're not going to load, then, then the answer would have been to say, well, we can pay, and here's, here's a US dollar payment. But here's he a, here's saying... a payment for the one that we loaded five days ago, and but we'll send you the payment for the next one in five days' time. But you were saying, we can't take dollars. So um, uh, then uh, saying, OK, we'll pay you dollars, wouldn't have um, solved the factual problem. No, as I say, my lord, there's no finding and no suggestion that they made an attempt to pay in dollars and it was rejected. The finding is that what they tendered was a non-contractual payment in euros. 
and then we weren't obliged to take that, and we were right. We then we were not obliged to take that because it was non-contractual. So one has our force majeure notice that says we can't expect to be expected to continue um, performance if we're not getting money coming in. And my Lord, Lord Justice Mills make the point it's five days in arrears. That is true. But one sees from the beginning of the award, there was some evidence from Mr. Gordon <coughs> that because of the way the uh, discharge port is set up and because of limitations on storage capacity at the low ports, in order to keep their refinery going efficiently, um, RTI really needs to have a continuous flow of 30 to 40,000 metric ton vessels. And that in the award in tab 7 is paragraph 14, I think. Paragraph 14. Mr. Gordon. Now, <clears throat> so the, the, the practical, yeah, paragraph 13, really, I mean, paragraph 13 of page 1. So there, there was apparently a practical constraint which meant that. RTI wanted to have a fairly continuous flow of 30,000 to 40 metric ton vessels. It wasn't any good to them to miss, say, four 40,000 metric ton vessels and then make up at the end of the month with a really huge shipment of 160,000 metric tons. So the way they wanted the, the contract to run was a fairly continuous loading and discharging operation. They didn't at one point um, argue that the berth had to be constantly occupied. That is paragraph. Uh, and so under the normal running of the contract, there's going to be a fairly continuous flow of cargo operations and a fairly continuous flow of payments five days um, after each shipment. And the practical point that we made in the force majeure period, because that's not, not a strictly legal one about when payment is due, but it's a practical point, that we can't be expected to be performing the continuous flow of cargo operations if the fairly continuous flow of payments five days in arrears is going to be interrupted. So that was where we um, began with the force majeure period in relation to payments. Then you have the tribunal finding against that context that it wasn't actually unlawful to make payments in dollars, but there would be the impediment described at uh, 45, which is expressed as being a crucial finding, and at 46 it couldn't be got around by routing the payment through other um, and then against that backdrop, one has the tribunal's conclusion at 51 that setting aside 36.3b, we made out our force majeure case, and therefore on the facts as found by the tribunal, 36.3a uh, and b uh, and c were all satisfied. And you're entitled to pray and aid the fact that the attacks on that, that aspects, of, those aspects of the award before the judge failed. They all failed. As findings of fact, they are sacrosanct and they cannot be challenged. The uh, attempt which was made to attack them was to attack them on a basis of legal analysis of causation and to argue that if what happened was that there was an impediment to payment and we said oh, in that case we're going to not perform any more cargo operations, we had brought the problem on our own head by that decision and it was self-induced force majeure. And the judge went through that in considerable detail uh, and he rejected that argument. And he did not give permission to appeal. So that argument is not before uh, your lordship. So, so that is where it rests. It rests with that undisturbed, unchallengeable finding by the tribunal that on the facts as they found them, 36 A, B, and C are all satisfied. So there was a, a relevant event. It might have been government orders, it might have been restriction on payments, I, I will qualify it. Um, a, a, and it had um, the relevant, satisfied, the causal requirement of. Um, of clause 36. And what the judge said was the fair reading, and I'm afraid I'm trying to find the way he said it, the fair reading was that um, the tribunal accepted our general common sense point that if there was going to be an interruption to payment, we couldn't be expected to continue the constant flow of loading and discharging if there was an interruption to the constant flow of payment. I was just trying to find um, where said that 
says at 146 that the tribunal's um, decision was common sense one. Mm. <coughs> Somewhere in, in the judgment written. Is it 162 that you're referring to? Um, page 96 in the bundle. This is few lines up from the bottom, it would make no commercial sense to the parties to be required, for example, continuously to load ships, which would then be unable to discharge, or would be subject to delays in discharge on arrival of a discharge. My Lord, yes. And, and also, and this is the one I had in mind, is 149 at page 93, where the, the judge said in the last few lines, it's ultimately common ground. And he also makes the point at 149 that the real complaint that the Chancellor's had was that the tribunal was wrong to conclude on the facts that there had been a sufficient causal connection. But as you said, that, you know, that uh, like Lord Dorchester answered a few moments ago, that was at best a mixed question of fact and law. It wasn't a pure question of, of law. And, and the judge concluded that it was in the range of permissible possibilities for the, for the tribunal to conclude. And again, he, the judge didn't give permission to appeal on any of that. So, so th there's no causation issue before the your lordship. It's the tribunal made the findings that it found. Um, it may be that its reasoning is not spelled out at all stages as explicitly as it might, but the fair reading of it is, is that having gone through the um, fact that there were the sanctions, uh, the fact that we said we cannot be expected to be paid, uh, to expect to be con continuously performing cargo operations if the flow of money is interrupted, H having gone through the practical impediments, if not legal impediments, which the sanctions would create to dollar sale, the tribunal made the findings it made, including the finding that the, uh, the, the causation requirement was satisfied. And the inference from all of that is that the tribunal found that there was a problem with payment, a practical one, not a legal one, based upon the crucial finding at 45, I would submit is the fair inference, uh, and that it had the necessary causal effect of uh, uh, preventing or delaying cargo operations. Uh, and the argument before the judge that no, it didn't because that was all self-induced was dismissed and is not the subject of appeal. Uh, and that's where, in my submission, the thing lies. And then coming back to, to, to my Lord and Lord Justice Arnold's point about who is the affected party. Now, <clears throat> it may be that, that if those were the facts, it would have been open to RTI to say, well, we are going to invoke force majeure because we can't <coughs> perform our obligations to pay you. Uh, and we don't sensibly expect you to perform without being paid, and therefore there'll be an impact um, on, on cargo operations. They did not do that. Now, there, there are two possible reasons why they didn't. One is, is that if your lordships have the clause, which begins at page 62 of the bundle, The, the basic position is that the contract performance is suspended while a force majeure event is in operation, but there's a carve out for accrued obligations to pay monies in respect <coughs> of previous voyage. Now, one possibility is that RTI looked at that and thought that that gave rise to at least a question as to whether they could legitimately invoke force majeure on the basis of payment. Who knows? The other, and perhaps this is the more commercially plausible um, Possibility is that they didn't want to declare force majeure because they did not want to suspend performance of the contract for the reason that Mr. Gordon explained to the tribunal. They wanted to have a continuous flow 
regularly of 30 to 40,000 metric ton shipment, it would not be helpful for them to suspend the performance for a couple of weeks and then try to catch up with a couple with a pair of mega shipments late in the day. That's not what they wanted. So it may be that the commercial inference is that they, they didn't declare force majeure because they didn't want to suspend the contract. Uh, uh, and that they hoped that we would either accept the payment they were tendering, which was non-contractual, or, or would wait um, until dollar payments could turn up and would, uh, would perform pro tem without them. Um, but whether they were entitled to uh, declare force majeure, and whether they had reasoned why they decided not to declare force majeure if they were entitled to, in my submission, can't have any bearing upon whether we were entitled to declare force majeure. And if we also became an affected party, even if that was chronologically later than RTI became an affected party, then at that stage we were entitled to force majeure. And we did. And the tribunal held that we were entitled to, subject to Article 36.3d, and, and that is where we, we come in. So you agree with? Ms. Silverat, then, that for um, relevant purposes, you are the party affected within the meaning of the law. Yes. And that's why we had to give a force majeure notice. One of the other issues was whether the force majeure notice that we gave complied with the contract and so forth. The judge, the tribunal, and the judge both held that it did, but we gave a notice because, because we were the party declaring force majeure and we therefore were the affected party. If RTI had declared force majeure, then, then they'd have been the affected party. But they didn't. So I guess more than I do accept that. Okay. Nice to find some common ground. <laughs> I was going to say something about the legal nature of our case. Um, and, and the reason I wanted to say a bit about it is this. RTI tell your lordships in their skeleton argument, paragraph 50, and my learned friend told your lordships several times this morning, that to succeed, Moore must persuade your lordships either that reasonable bears a special meaning as a matter of construction which excludes variation or non conjunctive performance altogether, or that there is an implied term to pretty much the same effect. And it's on the back of that contention that RTI sets out uh, in its skeleton argument of paragraphs 9 to 10, footnote 3, uh, a variety of principles of construction, reference to Arnold and Britain, Wood and Capita, and so forth, uh, uh, and tenders before your lordships the entirety of chapter 15 of Chitty on Contracts as a sort of handy aid memoir to the rule of implied contract. Um, uh, and in my submission, the proposition at paragraph 15 need to either show a special meaning or an implied term, is not correct. As I said to your lordships in, in open, the issue on the broad case is one of general application to all RE provisos which are silent in relation to variation or non-contractual performance, whether express, which are silent, or implied provisos which are by definition silent. And as we say in our skeleton, my lords, at paragraph 22, because it's a broad, general question of that nature, you're not going to find the answer by digging into the text of the particular wording of the particular force majeure clause in this, this particular contract. The narrow case does raise a linguistic, syntactical question about 36.3d. The one, my lord, Lord Justice Arnold mentioned to my learned friend, what does it mean in A, B, C, and D? That, that, that's, that's a real wooden capita iterative process coming back constantly coming back to the word issue. The broad question does not raise that. The broad battle lines on the broad case are RTI say you should just give regional endeavours the broad literalist meaning in which any form of response to an FM event is potentially within the clause providing it's reasonable and questions of contractual performance, non-contractual performance and variation are just a factor that goes to the mix of reasons. That's their position. Our position is that the reason we set out in the skeleton of, of authority and principle is that the approach should be rather more nuanced. Now, again, that, that battle line does not depend upon digging down into the text of, of Clause 36.3 and subjecting it to the Doesn't it, doesn't, doesn't it um, depend on what is meant by 
it cannot be overcome. Well, um, but that, mean, that, that you may, may well you be. May, you may say that uh, you can rely on other cases where similar language has been used or where um, clauses which don't have an express proviso have nevertheless been uh, said to embody essentially the same concepts, but ultimately isn't that a question of construction? But your, your Lordship may be right about that. Um, it's obviously, as your Lordship I think said to, to my learned friend, reasonable endeavours to overcome is, is a composite phrase in the sense that the reasonable endeavours have to be directed to something. So they're never going to be divorced from the overcome. We have tended in, in the argument on both sides to focus upon the reasonable endeavours. But one might come at it from the overcome perspective and say, well, if, if it doesn't overcome, then by definition it's not a reasonable endeavour which you have to perform. Yeah. Well, that's why I was uh, asking Dr. Atnam earlier. Yeah. I mean, so far as reasonable endeavours, what you actually had to do, if, if the solution which they proposed overcame the problem, it was very easy indeed for you to say, yes, OK, um, one doesn't really need to think about whether that would be a reasonable endeavour or not. The question is whether it yeah. overcame the problem. But if it doesn't overcome the problem, then by definition it can't be a reasonable endeavour that we have to Yes, quite. Yeah. yeah. So, so in a sense, you come to the So another way of looking at it is the one my Lord, Lord Justice Mayles put to Ms. Selver at them this morning, which is if the only question is one of whether they should accept a reasonable offer. I mean, it doesn't take any endeavours at all to decide whether or not to accept an offer um, of non-contractual performance. You can do that in the blink of an eyelid, really. Um, it doesn't require any effort. You know, it might require a thought, but it doesn't require any effort. Um, and so in that sense, the, the question is not really um, whether the, it requ required reasonable endeavours on the part of your... Um, the question is, was it reasonable that for them not to accept yes. what was being put forward? Uh, 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 and, and were we entitled not to accept it, particularly in, in Lord Justice Mayer's terminology, because it wouldn't have overcome the problem, and therefore we were entitled to say, well, it's not within the clause. And we do say it wouldn't have overcome the problem, because we do say um, that if you have something which is an impediment to performance of the contract according to its terms, you don't overcome that by performing a different contract. The impediment is still there, and you still can't perform the contract in accordance with the terms. So, so, so just to be clear, the, as a matter of language, on the face of it, the question is whether um, <coughs> doing something would overcome the force majeure event. Yeah. Well, the force majeure event is uh, it being unreasonable to expect you to load when uh, you're not clear about how you're going to be paid. Well, the question of what is the force majeure event is another quite interesting one, and it may depend upon how broadly or narrowly one wants to define it. On one view, the force majeure event is simply the US sanctions, and then there are consequences. A rather more nuanced view might be that the, 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 the force majeure event is, is sanctions causing delay to the payment of US dollars, and then that has an impact on the contract. But, Going back to, to, to my Lord's question, yes, uh, I see, uh, and I think that Ms. Helver Atman also sees, that while we have tended to concentrate on the reasonable endeavours part of the wording, it may be that we should more properly have focused on the overcoming part. That I do not, I would submit, does not change really the goalpost or the ambit of the debate, because if you look at the texts which talk about reasonable endeavours provisos being implied where there isn't an express one. Uh, Chitty uh, and Lewison and Peel phrase it in terms of reasonable endeavours to avoid or overcome. So it's very much the same sort of language. Um, uh, uh, and although I haven't done a trawl through uh, specimens, um, I, I would imagine or would anticipate that, that it's common to find reference to overcome or overcome and avoid in express reasonable endeavours clauses, just as it's normal to find express reference to reasonable endeavours. So, um, while accepting my Lord's point 
<coughs> focus rather more on overcome. I, I, I don't, in my submission, it's not going to make any huge difference to the analysis. Can, can I just explore it a moment longer? I mean, is this the real question? Would acceptance of the offer have overcome the forced adjourment? event? And it wouldn't have done. And is that not the real question? But maybe we might have looked at the event. Your, your logic will appreciate that since I've not you know, been involved in the case for some time, and that's not previously the, the basis upon which I put it, I'm slightly hesitant about saying outright, yes, of course, that is. Um, and I appreciate it's a way of looking at it. Uh, it may be right that it's the way of looking at it. I'll think about it first. But if that is the right way to look at it, then it wouldn't have done. Because um, it would not have overcome the problem with um, payment in dollars, because the, the problem was that they could not perform the contract according to its terms by paying in the contractual terms. And that problem is not overcome by switching the currency, because the problem still exists. They still can't pay in the right currency. Uh, it's very, very much as, as, as the question I think my, my Lord, or Justice Arnold's question to my learned friend this morning, when you're talking about overcoming, the context is something has happened which has affected the contract and is preventing it from being performed in accordance with its terms. And what you're looking for is a solution which allows you to perform it in accordance with its terms. Overcoming does not mean effectively Sorry. creating a new contract. Whether that's by a formal variation which is binding for all time, or by a temporary variation which only lasts as long as the force majeure clause does. It doesn't matter. If, you, if what you're doing involves a non-contractual performance, then you are not overcoming the problem and resuming contractual performance, which is what you should be looking to do. You're doing something else. And that's not overcoming. We're not required to do it. That's the basic point. Unless, as I say, unless the contract itself makes it sufficiently clear that we are. And, and am I right in therefore divining that this is your, your answer to um, how, as it were, the judge squared the circle? in that he respects the arbitrator's finding of fact that as to reasonableness, but reasonableness goes nowhere because you say it doesn't overcome. It doesn't overcome. And, and the, po the point is, there's this strange suggestion in my learned friend Skeleton that what really went on here was that the judge didn't like the finding of fact. And I, I don't know where that comes from. We didn't challenge the finding of fact because we appreciated that we couldn't. What we said to the judge, and this is what the judge accepted, was that's the finding that was <coughs> made as a matter of fact. The question is, does it matter? Is it relevant as a matter of law? And the answer is, as a matter of law, no. It is uh, an exact parallel with Bormann and Fennick, which, if, if time allows, I'm going to try to take a look it through. But there's a finding of fact, as my, learned, my Lord Lord Arnold pointed out, as my Lord Lord Arnold, or Justice Arnold pointed out, there is a finding of fact in Bullman, that if the charterers had redirected the ship while it was still at sea to one of the it was, other... It was Lord Justice Bates who pointed it out. Yeah. If, if the charterers had redirected the ship while it was still at sea to one of the other navy ports, the ship would have been discharged within the lay days, there would have been no delay. That was one finding of fact by the judge. There was then another finding of fact by that it was not reasonable, it was unreasonable, for the charterers to omit to take that step of redirecting the ship. In other words, they should, in the jury's view, as a matter of fact, reasonably have redirected the ship, and there would have been no strikes issued. That was a finding of fact. And it had no impact at all on the decision of the court. The decision of the court was you were entitled to rely upon the uh, events, the, 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 the exception. And that really is, an, this is why Bullman is an important case, that's an exact parallel to what we have in this case, where you have a finding of fact by the tribunal that if we were to behave reasonably in a general sense, 
large, we would have accepted this model. But it may not be quite the same, because if the um, party in Bullman had redirected the cargo, then what they get is a cargo at, I can't remember, Gravesend rather than London, which is, which is something different from what they are entitled to. Whereas in our case, if you had accepted the offer, uh, you would get dollars in your account, which is what you were entitled to, albeit you would get them through a, a, a non-contractual route. But you still get what you were entitled to um, by way of frame payment of freight. Well, my lord, if um, in Bullman and FedEx, receiving the cargo at Beckton or the Pool of London, rather than the Regent's Canal, would have been problematic for the ship. <coughs> That would perhaps have been an excellent reason why it would not have been reasonable to expect them to do that. But the finding of fact of the jury was that it would have been reasonable to expect them to do that. And we said we so, don't know why the jury reached that conclusion. No, well, we don't know why, but they did. Yeah. Uh, and therefore, the view of the jury does not appear to have been along your lordship's line of thinking. That they would have got something materially different from what they would have got if the cargo had been delivered uh, at Regent's Park. Indeed, that the finding is very clear. They should reasonably have redirected the ship. Uh, and indeed, what one sees in, in uh, Baron Pollock's uh, judgment was some reference to the way in which the, uh, the charters organised their business. But he says clearly expressly, well, that doesn't have any bearing upon the position under the contract. Presumably, it wouldn't unless it was known to, to the owners. So, my lord, um, with respect, given the finding of the jury, I, I, I do submit that the jury finding in Bullman is very much an equivalent of the tribunal finding in this case that it would have been reasonable for us to accept the offer. And we don't say that their finding was wrong, and we're not trying to get round the finding as a matter of fact. We simply say it's not relevant as a matter of law. Because that would have been a non-contractual performance. It would have been at least a temporary variation to the contract while the force majeure clause um, lasted. Uh, and we were not required to do that under 36.2. <coughs> Because uh, a reasonable endeavours proviso does not extend to uh, matters of uh, variation or contractual performance unless it makes it so clear that intention clear. Uh, uh, and that's the answer whether one says that the key words are reasonable endeavours or the key words are overcome. Can, can, can we just talk through the potential equivalent? You say the scenario is similar. Uh, and can't use reasonableness to circumvent the contractual obligation. Um, you're not in Bullman dealing with an express contractual proviso at all, are you? Um, uh, there was a strikes clause, wasn't there? But um, there was no express proviso to the strikes clause. What you have in Bullman and Fennec <coughs> is an exceptions clause in a charter party in the late time and demise regime, and it's an exceptions clause for um, strikes. Now, if one categorizes that as not being a force majeure clause, but as being um, an exceptions clause, that is not, contrary to what my learned friend suggested this morning, any relevant point of departure on this case, for the reason which we gave in our skeleton at paragraph 18. <clears throat> We've made the point of paragraph 16 that you're dealing here with a, a, an express reason in Venice but we make the point that if it's not express, is very readily implied. In the paragraph 18, there is an equivalence in exceptions clauses, well established, particularly in the context of shipping law, we give you logic some of the authorities there, that an exception will not apply if there's been negligence on the part of the uh, defendant. So that is functionally equivalent in the context of an exceptions clause for reasonable endeavours. So the fact that it is an exceptions clause 
fact that the uh, proviso is not um, set out explicitly in terms is not a point of departure either, because an equivalent will be in, implied. Again, it's not as though this express proviso has got any particularly exciting wording. It simply says reason endeavours to overcome, and one sees from the textbook that that's fairly, that's a fairly standard concept. Uh, and what will be implied is equivalent. And what one sees the, the Court of Appeal saying, the way the Court of Appeal put it, is tab one of the authority bundle. Let's go to the, the very commendably short Court of Appeal judgment at page 7. <clears throat> and in between the two hole punches, a passage that begins, a strike would in itself not be sufficient to exonerate the charter from doing the best they could accept the liberty. recognition that under that Charter Party, if the uh, Charters could have overcome their problem by reasonable endeavours, using a particular phrase, they wouldn't have been entitled to rely on the clause. And there's nothing surprising about that when one understands that exceptions clauses are implicitly subject to uh, a negligence exception and that a force majeure clause will readily be subject to, to a, a reasonable endeavours clause. So the fact that the uh, reasonable endeavours was not explicit is not a point of departure from Norman either. So you've got, you have in, in Bulmer and Fenwick, Getting Bulmer and Fenwick, I mean, there's seven points. I'm going to come on to this later, but I'll come on to it now. <laughs> but uh, three seven, so you have a contract which expressly contemplates a possibility of different methods of performance. Because, as you see from the terms of the Charter Party at page 180, it was to proceed as ordered from the Tyne to London uh, and to various possible places in London of the Charter's choosing. So unlike this case, you have a, an express contemplation of the possibility of different methods of performance. You have an event, in that case a strike, which was in um, the scope of uh, an exceptions clause, the exceptions clause referred to strike, and it, which had the specified causal effect on the selected mode of performance. The vessel had been sent to Regent's Canal and the strike um, delayed and prevented loading at Regent's Canal. So that was the contractual performance which the Charterer selected and it was, it was impacted by the strike in a way which fell within the exception. So putting those things together, you had at least a prima <coughs> facie right on the part of the charters to rely upon the strike's exception. You then have in the Court of Appeal, as we just saw, an express recognition that that prima facie right is subject to a proviso. I called it a reasonable endeavours proviso. I submit in, in, in substance that's what it is, but you see what the the Court of Appeal said about the Charters could not simply sit on their hands. It was incumbent upon them to bestir themselves if there was a way around the problem. You have a case put by the owners that the Charters 
should have varied the selected contractual performance. They should have changed their choice of going to the Regent's Canal by redirecting the ship to one of the other ports referred to in the contract. You have a finding of fact by the jury that that would have been a reasonable thing for the charterers to do while the ship was still at sea, and it was unreasonable for them to allow their original voyage orders to stand. And you have a decision of law by the first instance judge on the Court of Appeal against the background of that finding of fact by the jury that it was not incumbent upon the charterers to redirect the ship, and that their failure to do so did not deprive them of the protection of the exception. And I do submit there's a very close parallel with, with this case. Perhaps the main point of departure is this case does not actually express and contemplate different possibilities of performance. And in a sense, Norman and Fenwick would have been a stronger case for saying that the, the charters have to change their mind because the, the contract had expressly contemplated that they might send a ship to one of these other ports. In our case, the only contractual currency which is ever contemplated that's Bullman in a stronger case. But that aside, we do have the parallel. Tribunal, there has been an event um, within the force majeure period. You've got a finding by the tribunal, since they say that we satisfy every requirement of Hartman Post 6.3. You've got a finding by the tribunal that's had the, 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 the necessary causal effect. A finding, therefore, by the tribunal that we have a prima facie right to rely on the force majeure clause. And when they corrected the award, they did put that prima facie qualification in. We got the correction to the award in the supplementary <coughs> order. Um, an express, in this case, reasonable endeavours proviso, but the fact that it was expressed makes it not a point of departure because the Court of Appeal clearly recognised an equivalent in Bullman and Fenwick. Um, a case put by um, RTI that we should have agreed to vary the contractual performance by agreeing to accept payments in euros rather than dollars. A finding of fact by the tribunal, the equivalent of the jury, that it would have been reasonable for us to do that and it was unreasonable for us not to do that. All, right, all, all, all equivalent. And the outcome should be the equivalent outcome, which was the outcome which the judge arrived at. But in law, that finding of fact not relevant because in law the reasonable endeavours proviso, whether one looks at it in terms of reasonable endeavours or in terms of income, does not oblige us to take that step of varying the contractual performance. Uh, and so with great respect to my, my learned friend's attempts to explain Bullman away, the judge in, in that commission was absolutely right to say that a very relevant requirement, um, and that it points very strongly, even if it doesn't say it in terms, it points very strongly to the conclusion that the question is not simply what is reasonable at large, and contractual rights are simply a factor that goes into the mix. Contractual rights are of critical importance, uh, and if what is being proposed is something which would require you to give up a contractual right, whether permanently or temporarily, to vary the contract, whether permanently or temporarily, to accept non-contractual performance. Um, you're not obliged to do it, unless, unless the contract says it. I keep coming back to that point, and I do wish to emphasize that. We do not, contrary to some of the submissions which have been made by my learned friend, we do not propose some irrebuttable rule of that it's never possible in the context of these sorts of provisos for a party to be required to accept a non contractual performance, as I said earlier. If that's what the contract says, then that's what the court will give effect to. But you are coming to the question in the context of a clause which does not say on its face either way 
question is how should the court proceed? And what we submit is that the court should proceed on the basis that parties should not be taken to have given up contractual rights by agreeing to accept non-contractual performance under a reasonable endeavours provider unless that intention is made clear in the contract itself. Now, my lords, that really, that's the nature of our case. It doesn't depend on an implied term. It's not some overriding proposition of law. It doesn't depend upon a wooden capita, granular, iterative analysis of the wording of Clause 36.3.B because the whole point is that Clause 36.3.B just doesn't say anything helpful either way. As I say, it's entirely silent. And really what we propose is a principle of construction. And one finds these principles of construction forming part of the law of the interpretation of contracts. They are sometimes referred to as presumptions. Now, one which is very familiar, and we refer to it in our skeleton arguments, paragraph 36, is the Gilbert Ash modern engineering provision. Lord Diplock's famous dictum that parties should not be taken to have given up rights given to them by the Lord unless they've made that clear. Now, that is a familiar proposition, so that's worth briefly just looking at a couple of references to it. If your lordships have in the authorities one law, tab 27, at page 722, that's the beginning of paragraph 29001. Chitty? Yes, that's just Chitty, my lord. And if your lordships just read the first sentence and then read footnote 2, and footnote 2 really sets out the substance of Gilbert Ash's modern engineering. And if your lordships would then go to tab 29, page 735, this is Lewison. The heading of paragraph section 20 in bold is sort of a tracy of the Gilbert Ash proposition. Sorry, I must be looking in the wrong place. Where should I be? It's tab 29, page 735, my lord. Thanks. The bit in bold at the top under the heading of exclusion of particular rights or remedies, that's a sort of tracy of the Gilbert Ash proposition. And one then has it set out in the quotes at page 735. And then at the bottom one sees it's essentially a proposition of common sense. It's not based upon an implied term. It's not some overriding principle of law. It's plainly not expressed as an irrebuttable presumption. We don't argue for an irrebuttable presumption here either. We admit that the parties are free to make a contract extending reasonable endeavours provisions if they want to. 
Lord Clark at the top of page 736 by reference to Gilbert Ash making a similar comment and a number of similar points to, to the same effect. 12.146 on page 736 is, is quite interesting. It's been said that this principle provides a particularly clear demonstration of the ability of special principles of construction to serve the overall purpose of the general principles of contractual construction. Now, now well, that very much dovetails as where I came into it. This is, this is not an implied term. It's not the application at a granular level of wooden capita going through the syntax and the language with an iterative process. It's not a binding overrule, um, overriding principle law. It's a common sense principle which serves the purpose of construction effectively by serving as a supplement to the rules of construction by giving the court a jumping off point where you have, as you have here, a clause which is simply silent about whether it extends to non-contractual procurements or not. And a jumping off point under Gilbert Ash, if it's being suggested that a clause which is silent is taken away right, the jumping off point is that, well, it only takes the right away if it's clear. It, a quite a long way from this sort of clause, aren't we? Well, um, in, in the sense that um, what we're concerned with is a proviso to a force majeure clause. Um, if you declare a, a force majeure event, then um, you are saying the contractual provisions don't apply. Um, uh, and the proviso, um, so to speak, brings them back in. Um, so rather than uh, providing an extra escape route from the contract, it takes you back to the contract. On the thought, in my submission, we're not a long way away, actually. I mean, I, what I had originally, the original plan of articulating the point is that what we, what we are submitting for is a principle of construction, as Lewison says, which would be analogous to the Gilbert Ash principle that you don't take rights away unless um, that's made clear. When I thought about it, I thought, well, perhaps it, maybe it's not analogous. Maybe, in a sense, it is actually an application of the Gilbert Ash principle. Because what is being suggested here is that Clause 36.3b does have the effect of taking away from us, or can have the effect, subject to a condition, of taking away from us a contractual right. That being the contractual right to be paid in dollars. So, in a way, um, it's actually within um, the Gilbert Ash principle. But it actually confirms the loss of a contractual right. I mean, if, if clause 36 applies at all, then the contractual rights are gone. Well, if you're into clause 36.3, the contractual rights have been suspended. Contract remains. The contractual performance has been suspended. And the question is whether Clause 36.3D obliges, in effect, obliges us to give up a contractual right to be paid in a particular way in order to overcome the, to, to remove the suspension of the contract. There is no doubt that what is being suggested is that the contract would have been revived by our accepting the offer. But our right, contractual right to be paid in dollars, would disappear for the duration of the force majeure event. That, but it doesn't. It doesn't right. take away your right to be paid in dollars. You're still entitled to be paid in dollars. Uh, it simply means that you can't rely on the first majeure, force majeure event. And if you're not paid in dollars, that's a breach of contract by the um, charterers, uh, and you are entitled to recover whatever damages you've suffered. As a result, although in fact you haven't suffered any because um, an offer was made to you which the tribunal has found involved no detriment to you. And well, it may be that as a matter of strict legal analysis we are not deprived of the right. Um, but what is being suggested, and let's, uh, aside from the facts of this case, what is being suggested as a general proposition is that a party. Um, can be faced with the choice 
of either giving up a contractual right or losing the ability to rely upon the force majeure clause. And for all intents and purposes, it's the same thing as what's being spoken about in Gilbert Ash, of, of losing a contractual right. And maybe the Lord says in this case there have been no damages, but we're not just talking about this case. This is the broad proposition. This is the case of general application to all situations. And the case that's being put is that a clause like clause 36.3D can have the effect, as it was said in um, Vancouver Strikes case, of, of you either uh, sacrifice the right or you lose the protection of the force majeure clause. So it is, in my submission, in substance, even if your lordship is right as a matter of a strict legal analysis, in substance, we are either within or at least very close to the Gilbert Ash territory of do you construe a, a clause and a provision as, as having the effect of acquiring a party to lose a right. Uh, and I submit that either on the application of Gilbert Ash or by analogy with the approach of the court should be not to treat a clause as having that effect unless that intention is made sufficiently clear by the language of the clause. But it might be said that another distinction from the Gilbert Ash principle is the Gilbert Ash principle talks about rights conferred by the law and we're here talking about a right conferred by um, a contract. Um, but I do submit that the, the common sense of Gilbert Ash is equally applicable, whether there's a legal right or a contractual right. Uh, I won't ask your lordship to turn it up, but, but Lewison 12.1.5.1, tab 29, 738, um, says that. Uh, and he refers to a decision of Mr. Justice Tears, actually the Ocean Victory, a first instance in, in which Mr. Justice Tears said the same thing. I do submit that the, if, if it's a common sense principle, which it clearly is, then it's just as much common sense in the context of a contractual right as a common law right. So, well, that, that's the nature of our, the juridical nature of the case. It's got nothing to do with implied terms or rules of law or anything like that. Um, it's not, not really got anything to do with the, with the application of wooden capita uh, or ICS and West Bromwich or Arnold and Britain. In the nature of something like a Gilbert and Ash presumption. Uh, and for those reasons, in my submission, um, it's not helpful to your lordships to have to go away and read the, the lengthy, shitty chapter on um, in, implied terms. It's not really going to be particularly helpful to even look at Arnold and Britain and Wooden Capital because you don't need to get into the iterative exercises. Um, and it's not really necessary for your lordships either to um, decide whether or not an exceptions clause is to be treated, a force majeure clause is to be treated the same way um, as an exceptions clause. Uh, my learned friends at paragraph 10 have, have set out a number of authorities about that, um, including Professor Peel. <coughs> But you don't need to decide that because it's not really going to help you. Um, even if one assumes that a force majeure clause is to be treated as an exception clause to the extent that it should be construed contra proferentum. One saw from paragraph 50 of the Bank New York Mellon case that my learned friend took the lordship to this morning that the contra proferentum rule really does not have um, a great deal of room for manoeuvre when you're not talking about resolving an ambiguity of wording, a textual syntactical ambiguity. You're simply having to decide which of two approaches is the right one. <clears throat> Perhaps in, in the context of contra proferentum, in addition to the New York Mellon case, which my learned friend showed you this morning, I should just briefly show Lordship's another passage from Chitty in the authority's bundle at tab um, 24. 
with your Lordship's go to paragraph 1712, which begins at the bottom of page 660. says that there are two differing but closely related principles covered by the umbrella of contra proferentum. First is construction against the party who made the document. That isn't really what's an issue here. Between the two hole punches, the second principle is that any doubt or ambiguity be resolved against the, the party relying upon the clause. That has not been abandoned, but its significance in commercial contracts has been reduced. Then a bit of a discussion of the Nobahar and Cookson case. And then if your lordships go over to 662, round about the middle of the page, this text says the principle is. Uh, and there's a quote there from C Drill Manning, which again is really the Gilbert Ash principle. And then there's a quote uh, a little further down from Lord <coughs> Leggett in the triple point technology case, where he says that the contra proferentum rule may be losing its last vestiges of independent authority and being subsumed within the Gilbert Ash principle. Um, if your lordships go back a bit to page 654. In the same tab, seventeen eight begins at six five four. If you go over to six five five, between the hole punches, you've got a, a rather extended extract of the quote from Lord Leggett in, in triple point. And what one sees from those passages of Chitty is firstly the, the rather diminished role of contra proferentum in the modern law. And Secondly, the, the significance of the Gilbert Ash principle. And again, I do submit that we are, either we're within the Gilbert Ash principle because we really are being asked to give up a right, or we're at least within something which is very similar and analogous to the Gilbert Ash principle and should lead to the same common sense approach. But you don't reach that conclusion unless the wording is clear. As I said at the beginning of my submissions, it should be contracting in, not contracting out, when asking whether. The reasonable endeavours proviso extends to variation or non contractual performance. Hmm. Now, my lords, what um, RTI say, I think, to, to, to the nature of my case has been we rely upon a principle of construction and a rebuttal. And this may actually be the main point from RTA on the board case. What they say is that the authorities are set against the imposition of legal limits on the ordinary meaning of the words of an FN clause. So you shouldn't gloss an FN clause by reference to principles of construction in the way that I've just suggested. That is paragraph 14 of RTI's skeleton. Um, and I understand that to be a cross-reference to the principle of construction which opposed to paragraph 10f of RTI skeleton. And the authority which is referred upon there is Chitty at paragraph 26.82. And that is in your Lordship's bundle at tab 26, page 721. This is a paragraph on burden of proof, which begins at uh, page 720 towards the bottom, 26082. The requirements which a party may be required to prove, including circumstances beyond control and no reasonable steps that can be taken to avoid or mitigate, etc., etc. And I think that the, the point which my learned friends point to is the bit towards the bottom beginning, however, about four or five lines on the end. 
Now that emphasizes that it's necessary to have regard to the wording of the particular clause. That may be true, but as I've already said, the wording of this particular clause doesn't really give you any help at all. So, um, aside from that, what Chitty actually supports is not a, a broad proposition that the courts have set their face against um, principles which would um, add things to the, to the words given. It's actually a reference to a very particular decision that there's no justification for limiting the ordinary meaning of words in an FM clause to events or states of repairs not in existence at the date of the contract. Um, now, whether or not an FM clause or an exception clause extends to events which were already in existence at the time of contracting is a debate which is, is as old as the hilt. Uh, it was argued about at considerable length in the Vancouver strikes cases in, before Mr Justice McNair and in the Court of Appeal, because in a number of the cases, the strike had started before the charter was sent the ship to Vancouver. Uh, and the owner said, well, in those circumstances, the charter has just can't rely upon the strikes clause. And, and Mr. Justice McNair and the Court of Appeal both say, well, actually, yes, they can. And I'm going to understand why, because a, a charter ascending a ship to a, a strike-bound port may be confident that by the time the ship has crossed the Atlantic and got there, the strike will be over. So in, in that situation, why should they not be entitled to send the... Um, or even the Pacific. What? No. I said, or even the Pacific. Or the Pacific. Yes, my lord, yes. So they, may be, they may have a very long voyage on the go. Um, and it may, they may well think, by the time we get there, this isn't going to be a problem. Why should they therefore be, be barred in that situation from sending the ship to port just because there's a strike at the beginning of the voyage? So an absolute qualification, you can't send the ship to a strike-bound port. That, that doesn't really work. And one then says, well, could you send it whether you've got uh, honest belief that it will be, the strike will be over when it arrives, reasonable grounds, whatever. Um, but, but that's all very far from this case because we're not here talking about... Um, pre-existing clause control. But in any event, that, that debate is not authority <coughs> for proposition that it is not permissible to um, apply principles of construction like Gilbert Ash in the context of clause control clause. The other authority, which I think my learned friend had in mind for this proposition that the courts have set their face against supplementing the plain wording of, of clause control clause is the New York Mellon case, which um, uh, my learned friend showed you in, in some detail this morning. Um, I won't ask your lordships to look it up again because you did look it up. But what you had there was a banking contract subject to English law and non-exclusive English jurisdiction. You've got a clause, whether you call it an exceptions clause or a force majeure clause, doesn't really matter. You've got a clause that says that the defendant is not the bank, is not to be liable if um, performance is interrupted by order, rule, regulation, or requirement imposed by any judicial authority. The defendant bank is Belgium. It's got a bank in Holland, a branch in Holland as well as in London. The Belgian and the Dutch courts uh, made effectively attachment orders against the claimant's assets in the defendant's hands. And the question was whether or not those orders were within the clause as amounting to any order, rule, regulation, or requirement imposed by any judicial authority. And the claimant customer said it wasn't within the clause because um, on the true construction of the clause, any order, rule, regulation, or requirement should be confined to uh, orders, etc., etc., which were either made in or were enforceable in England. And the Court of Appeal and the first instance judge said, no, that's not right. There is no such thing as enforceable. Now, the, the first thing to note about the New York Mellon case, my lords, is this. It's a bit peculiar, actually, when one thinks about it, to find my learned friends relying upon it as, as supporting their position. Because what you had there was a clause excusing performance. And the claimant was seeking to cut down the extent to which the defendant could rely upon that clause by saying that the clause was subject to an um, implied limitation. And what you have in this case is a defendant, Laura, relying upon a clause, the first, first majority 
the excused component. And the claimant is trying to cut down the extent to which Moore can rely upon that case. RTI is trying to cut down our entitlement to rely upon that case. So, functionally, in this case, RTI is in the position of the claimant in the New York Mellon case. The claimant in the New York Mellon case which was trying to impose these limitations and they were rejected. And the answer was given was no, the defendant is entitled to rely upon the court. So it is a bit odd that, um, that, that, that RTI, which is in the functional position of the unsuccessful party in New York Mellon, relies on New York Mellon. Never mind. The second point about the New York Mellon case is it's clear when one goes through the judgment that the, um, the claimant was unable to come up with any point of principle at all as to why the clause should be confined to orders or judgments which were made or enforceable or recognisable in England. Mr Justice Popplewell actually gave nine points of principle why the argument just wouldn't wash, which, which I think the Court of Appeal substantially agreed with. And, and the most <coughs> clear of them, perhaps, uh, is at the back of the judgment at page 615, paragraph 68 and following, where the Court made this comment in its point. Well, you've got this bank. It's got branches in Holland um, and Belgium where these orders were made. It's probably got branches all over the world. Um, it's at risk of these orders being enforced against it in these jurisdictions where they've been made because it's got assets there. Uh, and in that context, it just doesn't make any sense at all, commercially, to suggest that these orders should fall outside the scope of the protection. And the protection should be confined to English orders or orders enforced in England. And thirdly, my lords, um, whatever else one sees from it, the, the Bank New York Mellon case is clearly a one off in this sense that it not only turned upon the meaning and effect um, of, of the particular contract in that case, but also the claimants were relying upon factual background specific to that case as being relevant to the construction. One sees that, for example, at paragraphs 53 and following. I won't ask you to look it up, but there's discussion about the, the background, the factual matrix to when the contract was included. It's very much a case of its own contract and of its own fact, very different from here, from where your lordship saw face, as I said at the outset, with a question of broad principle. How do you approach this sort of clause? Um, and a one-off dispute about a particular clause and the particular facts in New York Mellon does not assist your lordships in the question your lordships have to decide in this case. And it is not an authority for a proposition that the courts have somehow turn their face away from relying upon supplementary principles of construction in deciding how to approach force majeure clauses. And in fact, one knows that it's actually not at all uncommon for the broad wooden capita ICS Arnold and Britain principles to be supplemented by particular principles of construction. Sometimes um, they're very narrow. <coughs> For example, um, perhaps they've all familiar to my Lord, Lord Justice Males and, and the other two before the Lordships, but the Grant and Coverdale rule, presumption, rebuttable it is, but that a reference to loading in an exceptions clause is confined to the process of getting the cargo from the shore to the ship, not doesn't include the process of getting the cargo down from um, the countryside and into the port. That is a principle of construction which supplements the ordinary rules of construction in the context of playtime and demerit exceptions. That's very specific. And there are other areas of law where there are very specific rebuttable presumptions which uh, apply in addition to the ordinary principles. And then there are some principles of construction supplementing the ICS and West Bromwich rules which are of general application. Again, a good example of that is given to law protection. But it's common uh, and there is simply no basis for the broad proposition Put by my learned friend that the courts, in the context of force majeure clauses, have somehow sternly set their face against anything of the sort. But at the same time, if you're suggesting there's a general principle presumption to be taken into account, the basis for that in the authorities is also pretty thin. It isn't that we've got a whole line of cases expounding this principle. 
Um, no. It's rather that we're <laughs> searching around in this case here and that case there to, to see what might be thought to be the principle. No, there, there, there is not, my lord. Um, and there is not a case which says in terms that the, the, that the court should apply that sort of approach. But again, I do submit that as with Gilbert Ash, it, it is it's common sense. And that's the point of, of Gilbert Ash. You don't expect people to go round lightly giving up their rights. Because rights are important. I think we set this out as one of our points of principle in our, in our skeleton argument. <coughs> Coming back to earlier ground we were on earlier, you had the chance to insist on your rights and you didn't. Well, we insisted on our rights, my lord, in the sense that we said we weren't going to accept payment that wasn't in dollars. That's what we were offered, and we said we weren't going to. Yes, I mean, at the, you, you quite right. At the time, you perceived it on the basis that it would be illegal to pay you in dollars. Um, but um, but anyway. we, we did insist on our rights. Um, and the point about it being a right. Is that we had the right to do that. Well, you didn't, in the event. Um, <laughs> and you had the right to invoke the clause, but you didn't have the right <coughs> to, payment to, to uh, object to payment in dollars. Well, we didn't. We were not entitled to say. We were wrong to think, as we did at one time, that it would be unlawful to accept payment in dollars. But we stood by our contractual right to be paid in dollars rather than paid in euros. As I said to your lordship a moment ago, and you know, we have the right to stand by our rights. That's 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 what rights are about. We 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 said a bit about this in our skeleton at 35 to 37. Um, what we said out there may just come across as a bit trite, but it's nevertheless it's, in, it's important to, to bear in mind. Uh, contractual rights um, are taken seriously in English law, um, and aside from particular areas where good faith may be a factor. The general approach of English law um, is that a right is a part of the bargain which the contracting party buys and pays for as part of the bargain. And it is something which the party is entitled to exercise in its own interest as it sees fit. It is not generally required to exercise its rights in a way which might seem reasonable in the most general of senses, an arbitration tribunal or a judge. Nor, given the uncertainty which is inherent in that exercise of assessing what might a tribunal or judge consider to be reasonable in, in the most general senses, would it be desirable if parties were expected to exercise their rights by reference to what is reasonable in general terms? But they're not exercise them in their own interests. And, and if a clause is going to be said to change that position and in effect require a party to surrender a contractual right or lose the protection of um, a force majeure clause or sanctions on not surrendering a contractual right, then, then the intention should be made clear. And although there may be no case that says that in terms, is in my submission, like Gilbert Ash, really no more, my lord, than common sense. He's not some stunning intellectual breakthrough raising challenging conceptual issues. It really is just a point of common sense that must be made and, and be reliable. Now, my lord, having um, taken your lordship to that passage of the skeleton where we refer to the importance of contractual rights and the protection which is generally given to them in English law, um, that may be a convenient point at which just to remind your lordship that 
we do submit that the principle of construction, the common sense principle of construction which we propose, is supported by considerations of principle. Uh, and we set four of them out in paragraphs 26 to 39 of the skeleton. And since I set them out in 26 to 39 of the skeleton, I don't want to go through them all um, in great detail. But perhaps I can just say by way of summary, uh, the first point we make is that an FM clause usually is going to be directed to an event or state of affairs which is affecting performance of a contract according to its terms. And that's the a bit to emphasize, according to its terms. Uh, and that's why it's sometimes necessary, one sees in the case law, to, for the court to begin by ascertaining what performance the court contract requires according to its terms. Because it's only once you've worked out what performance is required according to the terms of the contract that you can see whether or not the force majeure event is, is affecting it. Uh, so, for example, in Brightman and Bungy and Bourne, you have there a charter party to load a contract of wheat and or rye and or maize. Uh, and the charterers had encountered difficulties getting wheat. And they relied upon a clause that, that protected them if, quote unquote, the cargo cannot be loaded. The question then was, well, does the fact that you can't load wheat mean that the cargo cannot be loaded? That turned upon a question, an analysis of what was the contractual cargo. And the Court of Appeal said, well, this is a contract under which you've got to load wheat or rye or maize or a combination of the three. Uh, and if you can't get wheat, that doesn't mean you cannot load the contractual cargo. It just means you can't load one possible contractual cargo you've got to load one of the others. So that was a case in which the impediment was not affecting performance of the contract according to its terms, once one had worked out what performance of the contract according to its terms meant. That's by contrast with Vancouver strikes, where a charter party which referred to wheat, barley, or flour, was construed by the House of Lords, and by the Court of Appeal, and by Mr. Justice McNair, as being um, a wheat charter party, with an option given to the charterers to exercise in their own interests, as they saw fit, to load barley or flour instead. Unless and until they exercised that option, it was a wheat contract, and if they couldn't get wheat, then not possible to load the cargo, because that was the contractual cargo, and, and therefore the relevant clause was having an effect on performance of the contract according to its terms. And it's precisely, we would submit, because uh, an FM clause is directed, at least usually, to an impediment to contractual performance according to terms, it, it logically follows our freedom of endeavours proviso, or in an exceptions clause, a negligence proviso, is directed to overcoming the impediment so that the contract's performance can be resumed according to its terms. And to some extent, I've already been through this point in response to a question from Lord Justice Mayo, but, but overcoming an impediment means getting back to a position where you can perform the contract according to its terms. It doesn't mean switching the terms around and, and performing a different contract, unless, again, the exemption clause makes clear that that's what's intended. And if, if the charter is in the Vancouver strikes case, had exercised their option and switched from wheat to barley. That would not have brought the strike to an end. It would not have removed the impediment to loading wheat. The facts would have remained exactly as they were. And the original wheat contract would have remained 
exactly as incapable of performance. What it would have done is, is change the contract into something else. It would not have restored the status quo of performance according to the contractual terms. And, and it's the same here. Are accepting payment in euros instead of dollars would not have restored the status quo of performance of the contract according to its terms. It would not have brought an end to the sanctions. It would not have brought an end to the practical effect of the sanctions on the payment of dollars. The position would have been exactly as it was before. It wouldn't have overcome the situation. It would have done something different. It would have changed the contract. Changed the performance, at least for the duration of the force majeure event. That is not what a, a, an overcoming by reason of endeavours proviso is directed at, unless it makes it clear. Now, now my lord, um, this point that um, RE provisos, unless expressed otherwise, uh, are, are directed to reinstating contractual performance with its terms, uh, links to a point we make in our skeleton paragraph 17, so perhaps this is a good juncture in which to mention. Um, and, and that is um, that a reasonable endeavours proviso is logically a corollary of the requirement for causation. Um, and I think from a comment my learned friend made this morning that, that, that she would agree with this. Force majeure clause differs from what is sometimes referred to in the textbooks as a contractual frustration clause. That is to say, a clause which provides that a contract will be suspended or terminated upon the happening of a given event. One which one quite commonly sees in, in charter parties is, is outbreak of war, including any of the five members, permanent members of the United Nations Security Council. As soon as that happens, the contract is at an end or suspended. There is no inquiry into whether or not, or to what extent, the event has had an impact upon the performance of the contract. But force majeure clause, unless expressed otherwise, is different. Force majeure clauses are generally engaged only if the event has had some specified impact on the performance of the contract according to its terms. That's usually expressed in terms of hindered or delayed or something like that. But there is a causal ingredient as part of the definition before the, the, the clause can be triggered. So if uh, in a force majeure clause, as opposed to a contractual frustration clause, one of the specified events happens, uh, but it just doesn't have any impact on performance of the contract at all, then the force majeure clause is not triggered because the causal requirement is not satisfied. But if one of the specified events happens and it does have some sort of impact upon the contractual performance, but that impact can be overcome by reasonable endeavours on the party effect, then again, the causal impact is not satisfied because the cause is properly to be regarded as the affected party's failure to exercise reasonable endeavours, not the event. Just as it's in an exceptions clause, if the operation of a peril could have been avoided but for the defendant's negligence, then the defendant's negligence, rather than the peril, is to be properly to be regarded as, as the cause, and that falls outside the Carol's cause because the causative requirement is not satisfied. Uh, and I submit that if you think about it, um, the fact that um, these sorts of provisos go to causation is perhaps one reason why the courts are so ready, as one sees from Chitty and Lewis, to imply reasonable endeavours provisos in force majeure clauses and to imply negligence exceptions in, in, in perils clauses. Um, my learned friend cautions you by reference to the Marks and Spencer and BNP case. Uh, you, you don't readily imply um, terms, and you don't imply a term just because it's reasonable, it's got to be necessary, and one, one sees the warnings from the Supreme Court um, in that case. Um, that sort of thinking doesn't really seem to be a concern to the courts in implying reasonable endeavours provisos in FM clauses. Or, or negligence exceptions and perils clauses. And that, that may be because um, the court isn't really adding content to the clause when it imp implies those provisos. It's just really spelling out and emphasizing.
causal requirement which is already there in the express wording, sort of teasing the point out. Now, the fact that um, endeavours provisos and, and force majeure clauses uh, are a logical corollary of the requirement of causation has the effect which uh, is stated in the passage from Professor Peel at paragraph 12.45, tab 34, page 780. Uh, my learned friend did show you this this morning. But it's a passage which refers to Mr. Justice Tears decision in the Tully case. Uh, and the substance of what Professor Peel says is, is this, um, and in my submission is right. The courts, uh, for reasons of analysis, and it may be very helpful to proceed in this way because it gives them a structure, may have a tendency to take it in stages and ask, was there uh, a force majeure event? which falls within the definitions of the listed events. Did it have um, the necessary causal effect? If so, could it have been overcome by reason and death? But, says Professor Peel, in fact, if you think about it, the supposed distinction between did it have the necessary causal effect and could it have been overcome by reason and death may be theoretical more than anything else because you are simply looking at causation from slightly different perspectives but you are ultimately looking at a causal question and you are ultimately at those supposedly different states <coughs> of analysis looking at the same thing. I mean, take the Brightman case, for example. A case where the charterers couldn't load their wheat, but the obligation was to load wheat or barley or rye, and so if they couldn't load wheat, they had to load barley or rye instead. Right? You might say that's a case um, in which there simply was no force majeure or, uh, event in the first place because there was no causal effect on loading of the contractual cargo because it was still possible to load barley or rye. Or one might say, well, there was a causal effect of a sort on the um, loading because it wasn't possible to load the cargo which the charters had in mind, but it could be overcome by loading one of the other cargoes. It doesn't really matter which way you look at it. It comes out at the end of the day to the same conclusion. And in, in my submission, it comes out the same conclusion by basically the same route, which is causation thinking. Now, um, the relevance of that to the question before the court is this. There's nothing in the case law or in the textbooks to suggest that the possibility of variation or non-contractual performance is relevant the stage where the court is breaking down the analysis and saying, has there been a force majeure event in the first place? Um, if the charterer invokes a force majeure clause or a perils clause saying that loading of the contractual cargo was prevented by strikes, there's nothing that suggests that it would be an answer for the owner to say, well, it's true that strikes prevented loading of the contractual cargo, um, but it was possible to load another cargo which would have been a quote unquote commercially reasonable sub performance, the phrase used in one of the cases. Uh, and because it was possible to do something different which would have been commercially equivalent, there was never any force majeure except at peril at all. That's not an answer at the early stage of the analysis to say, well, there, there was no causal event because you could have gone done, done something else which would have been just as good and would have been a reasonable thing to do. Uh, and if reasonable commercial equivalent or, or some notion to that effect is not an answer when one is asking, has there been a force majeure event which has had the necessary effect on performance? It would be odd if it could be an answer at the um, reasonable endeavours proviso stage, if, as I submit, the reasonable endeavours proviso stage is just asking the same question, the same causal question, from a slightly different perspective. It would be very odd indeed. 
because you're really focusing on the same thing ultimately. Causation. And it would be peculiar if it would come in at one level and not the other. We're just asking the same question. Uh, and in my submission, it doesn't come in at either level. Again, absent wording otherwise. Uh, and, and if having looked at the question of causation from all possible angles, from the was there an FM event which had a requisite impact angle, and then from the could it have been overcome by reason and delta angle, if having looked at causation from all angles, a court or tribunal comes to the conclusion that the causation requirement is established, then in my submission, the reasonable endeavours proviso is spent. Because the reasonable endeavours proviso, again, is its part of causation. And here, a tribunal held that causation was established. There was a challenge before Mr Justice Bacon based upon when it was all self-induced. That failed. There is no appeal from that. tribunal held, and the judge agreed, that the causation element was established, and the reasonable endeavour provision is therefore spent. It doesn't come back to life, <coughs> or have a second life, going beyond causation, which requires the affected party to agree to uh, a, a variation or contractual non-performance to overcome the causal element. And in a sense, in, in my submission, this was the mistake that the tribunal made. The tribunal, one sees from paragraph 51, they haven't considered all the facts, of course, but they came to the view that, that everything was satisfied, subject to consideration of clause 36.3.B. So they came to the view that the basic causation requirement was satisfied. And the mistake they made in was that they thought that 36.3d added some additional further requirement. And it doesn't, because it's just part of causation. And to succeed on the appeal, really, my learned friend has to satisfy your lordship that 36.3d does have some independent life, and that it does have some super-added effect going beyond um, what's already in the my submission, it doesn't. It is just another perspective for looking at causation. I mean, that, that does seem to run counter to what might be thought to be a general approach to contractual interpretation, which is if you find some wording, it's meant to add something. Well, my lord, I appreciate that. And you say because that your lordship says, is irrelevant. Your, your lordship will say, well, uh, that can't be right because it means that 36.3d effectively becomes redundant. Now, there are two answers to that, my lord. One is, um, it is it's a familiar proposition that arguments from redundancy are not of any great weight in commercial contracts. And the second one, my lord, is the one we made earlier in our skeleton argument, the, the readiness of the court to imply a reasonable endeavours proviso if it's not expressed. Now, if there was not a clause 36.3d, the court would imply it. There is nothing in this contract which could possibly be relied upon to exclude the implication of a reasonable endeavours proviso. And, and therefore, my lords, I, I would say yes. If the clause would imply it anyway, if, forgive me, if the court would imply it anyway, then yes, it probably is redundant. The, what's the basis for saying that what the court would imply would be a clause in these terms? Well, it would be something to one sees for it from more than authentic as the example. Um, you see what the court said. You can't sit on your hands. It's it's in substance. But that could be a causation point, not a well, an implication a, point. Well, my lord, well, your your lordship will understand what I say about that. Um, I mean, it's, it's the same thing. Your, well, quite. So you, I just said that. You, uh, quite, say it so, so turning it's back the same on you, your own submission. It's the same thing. Uh, it's entirely consistent with the court treating that purely as a causation point and having nothing to do with implication. Well, um, if it comes to exactly the same conclusion, my lord, it doesn't matter whether you look at it as a causation point or as an implied term point, because it comes to the same result, and it still has the effect of making the express term redundant. I quite follow that if um, 
an implied term, merely reflective causation, then it would be redundant. But what is the authority for the implication? It can't be Bullman, because as you say, that can be explained as, as causation. Well, my lord, it's suggested by um, my learned friends that Bullman has nothing to do with implied provisos and um, is all about causation. Um, the first thing I say about that, at the risk of repeating myself, is that the suggested distinction between a proviso and causation is false. Because as I've just been saying, an express proviso, and it's the same with implied provisos, a proviso which requires you to exert yourself to overcome the impediment, whether you call it reasonable mitigation or reasonable endeavours, a clause which requires you to take reasonable steps to overcome the impediment, um, whether it's an express proviso or an implied proviso, it is looking at matter from a causation perspective. So to say, um, well, in Bullman they were thinking in terms of causation rather than implied proviso is to postulate a distinction without a difference. Because an implied proviso, just like an express proviso, really is looking at it from a causation perspective. Doesn't that, that rather beg the question? I mean, it, 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 that, that suggests first that Bullman is not authority for an implied proviso. Uh, and when we do find an express proviso, why should we take it to mean uh, merely the causation argument, which would be implied anyway. Well, because my, my lord, one asks, why do the courts require, um, why do the parties require people to take reasonable endeavours to overcome the impediment? And the answer, if you think about it, is a matter of, let's say, say common sense, is because they're saying, well, you know, if you can overcome it by reasonable endeavours or reasonable exertions or mitigation or whatever, when, whatever you want to call it, then that is the thing that's properly to be regarded as the cause. That's precisely why something which is uh, avoidable by exerting yourself, you shouldn't be entitled to rely upon it as, as a force majeure um, ex or an exception, because it's not really the event which is causing the problem. It's your own failing to bestir yourself in, in, in response to it. So that is why sorts of clause in. That is why the court implies them if they're not parties. It's not something distinct from, from, from causation. But, my lord... Um, and just to be clear, I'm probably forgetting something here. What is the authority, Bullman apart, the implication of the proviso in the force majeure context? Well, my lord, um, I think the most convenient point is there's a paragraph on the skeleton of the quite early stage, which I will well, paragraph 16 cites Chitty and Lewison. Yes, what Lord. authorities they cite? Um, I don't know. Well, well that's, let, let's look at them, my Lord. Um, Chitty <coughs> 26, 66 is in tab 26. And this is some general propositions. <clears throat> so this, this is um, general propositions about what the court will tend to expect from a force majeure clause not tied to any particular form of expression in any particular force majeure clause. Um, and the court is likely to conclude that the type of event is blah, 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 could not have been overcome um, or avoided by the taking of reasonable steps. One of the authorities which is cited there is Bullman. Another one is VNS Contracts. That is not put on the basis that Bullman decided it purely as a matter of causation. Uh, 2682 should be in the same tab. Page 720, 
contract a party may always be required to prove non-performance due to circumstances on its control, no reasonable steps it would have taken to avoid or mitigate the event or consequences. The authority cited there, Court Note 368, a BNS contract. Again, I'll take your lordship through BNS contracts, I think. And then Lewis and paragraph 13, 23 to 28, is uh, in tab 30 at page 744. Again, you'll see at 1323 that one of the authorities which Lewison cites is Foreman and Fenwick again. And it's quite interesting, my lord, in terms of your lordship, well, isn't that just all about causation? To see what Lewison says at 1324, this has been taken as a principle of interpretation. Well, I'm not sure it matters for your purposes, but that essentially is not a matter of implication, it's a matter of interpretation. It's not saying, my lord, that it's all just a question of causation. But again, without wishing to repeat myself, even if it was, that's what a reasonable endeavour clause comes down to anyway. That's the distinction without a difference. Uh, there's then a, a quote from BNS contracts. Lord Justice Griffith said over the page, clauses of this kind have to be construed upon the basis. Lord Justice Carr, towards the bottom of the bit that's quoted in 1325, subject to the principle that the party seeking to rely on it must show. Again, it's not saying that it's all just down to causation, but even if they did say that, it wouldn't make any difference. In uh, the Channel Island Ferries case, that was one of the authorities cited in one of the footnotes of Chitty. There's a bit of an extract from that at the top of 746. The clause there simply referred to beyond the, beyond the control of the relevant party. The court held that um, that would extend or the party must show you've taken all reasonable steps to avoid the operation or mitigate the result. So it's not good enough just to show that you couldn't prevent it happening in the first place. And then at 1332, the equivalent in relation to, to proper exceptions and exceptions perils clauses, the courts interpret exemption clauses as not applying where a party seeks to rely on his own negligence. Now again, your logic may say to me, well, that doesn't in terms say that it's expressed proviso, but not in substance. That is the way that the, the courts interpret these things, and in substance that is, that is a proviso um, that um, you cannot rely upon the clause of your negligence. And again, why? Because it's causation. And as I said, um, my learned friend just agreed with that this morning. And although I've gone a bit over time, I think that may be a good point to stop today. Uh, so we'll break now and start again at uh, 10.30 in the morning. All right.